Hello, coaches. Welcome back to episode three of our Hockey Eastern Ontario Skill Acquisition Series. We are delighted today to be joined by Rob Gray, a fellow Canadian. Mm -hmm. Rob is from Toronto, hails from the Toronto region. Mm -hmm. um, he is currently an associate professor in human systems engineering at Arizona State University. He is the host of the Perception and Action podcast which I deem to be a must listen to for any coach out there working in the sport world. But more importantly than any of that for me, Rob is the author of two exceptional uh, learning resources. He's the author of How We Learn to Move and Learning to Optimize Movement, both of which sit proudly on my shelf. And <laughs> I will say I have read. Um, but the first one for sure, coaches, How We Learn to Move is a must read. Uh, for any of us working with youth and trying to wrap our heads around this skill acquisition and how we get them to learn how we want them to move and what we want them to do the way we want them to do it and the environments that we put them in to help achieve that. So we're very excited today to have Rob with us. Rob, welcome. Um, I'll turn it over to you to let you do a little bit of a more deeper dive on your background and, and bio and then we'll get started. Thanks, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Yep. So, yeah, I'm from, I grew up an hour north of Toronto. I played ice hockey all my youth. I was a goalie. Um, I always say that's what, you know, gave me kind of interest in perception. That it was survival, right? Um, so, yeah, my background, so I, background training is in psychology. Um, and uh, so I, I went to, in Toronto, I went to Queen's University and an undergrad in York University in Toronto. So I did all my schooling in Canada as well. Um, and so I, I start out studying vision, basically understanding how we perceive movement, right? How, we, how do we know how long it's going to take before something hits us, like a puck, how much time we have, uh, what direction it's going. So that's why I first started. And then I um, more slowly moved into uh, understanding how we acquire skills, how we train to get better at sports skills, how should we design practice. And I've been doing that for a few years. The, the main sports I work in right now is, is in baseball, um, being here in Arizona. Um, it's a good place for it. And golf, also a fair bit in, in a few other sports. But So I do a, a bunch of consulting as well with coaches and organizations and, and governing bodies. So um, understanding how uh, people get, you know, acquire skills. And as you mentioned, I've been doing the Perception Action podcast for a few years and from that kind of spun out the, the books kind of presenting this different way of thinking about skill that I know you, like you, as you mentioned, you had Stu and Ed on uh, already talking about some of the different ideas to what we're traditionally taught about how we learn. Yeah. Right. Well, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here. Let's jump yeah. right in, Rob, because I know you're a very busy individual in your line of work. Um, so we'll try to keep this to, you know, 50, 55 minutes so we can Perfect. get you out of here on time and, and, and keep you on your busy schedule. Um, in, in your first book, How We Learn to Move, there's an awful lot of reference and discussion and talk in there on a concept called perception action coupling. Mm -hmm. As a hockey guy, mm -hmm. as I read your books, I kept hearing read and react, read and react, mm -hmm. which is the, you know, the, the terminology we kind of use in our game, you know, that read and react skill. Let's dive a little bit more into sort of this, this perception action coupling. And in particular, it was very inter interesting. I've heard you speak a number of times where you talk about the athlete's need to not only perceive to act, but also act to be able to perceive. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to let you loose on that for a while. And then yeah, the yeah. so yeah, perception action coupling is the idea that comes from a researcher named James Gibson. It's the idea that you know, all our movements we make are driven by what we perceive from the environment, um, you know, what we pick up uh, from the, our environment. And we don't always practice them that way, <laughs> but that's the, the way it should happen. And so we have this link between I perceive, act, but also I act to perceive, you know, I... Um, when I looked around, when I'm going to receive a pass, I look around to know where I'm going to make the next pass or where I'm going to go. 
Um, the example I always I love to use is is a two on one in hockey, right? A skillful hockey player is um, moving so as to make the defender do something, right? They're not they're trying to pick up information about what the defender is going to do, whether they're going to come to them, stay with the other player, and then make a decision based on what they're they're perceiving. So they're really acting so as to kind of make the, the, the other player do something so that they can receive it. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's the fundamental idea that we're always, all of our actions are always driven by information from the environment and the idea that we need to keep that together as much as possible. So if we practice, you know, um, you know, when I practice stick handling around cones, I've taken away information. There's no perception there really. There's no information from a cone telling you which way to go, as opposed to a defenseman that's leaning one way or the other. Um, so, yeah, so that's it's kind of the, the, that basic idea that the two are always linked and we have to try to keep them linked as much as possible. Yeah. So you hit you, you you kind of touched a little bit on, you know, the cone example. And, mm-hmm. and whenever, you know, whenever we talk to people who are very embedded in, um, you know, the ecological dynamic perception type value of the environment sort of mindset, the cones tend to be the, yeah. the most often used example when we start mm-hmm. going around cones. Yeah. In my, when a, yeah. In my when, sports, baseball, it's batting tees. Is there, batting tees, yeah. yeah. Like to pick on, yeah. Yeah. Those plastic things, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So from a design perspective, as a coach, as a coach in youth sports, minor hockey or any sport really, but we're talking hockey, obviously, in our example. What What is the impact then? What, what would you describe as the impact on how a coach needs to think about perception mm-hmm. and the power of perception when they're designing learning environments. So I sit down to design my practice environment. I'm putting together my activities. Mm-hmm. Like what's the danger of me ignoring perception, action coupling, or putting the player in an environment where they can actually perceive things? Yeah. The the big danger, well, there's a couple. One is that, you know, they're not going to know, it's not going to transfer into the actual environment, right? Every coach has seen the player that can stick handle and do all these tricks with the puck on their own and then you put them on the ice when there's other players and they don't know when to pass or shoot or what to do so they're not going to be you're not going to learn when to do those things is kind of the big way and you mentioned reading and read and react you know you're not going to be a good decision maker um you know when do i pass shoot go left go right i do those things because i'm driven i learn to use the information i pick up my perception to know when to do those things. And so if you don't train it that way, it's really hard to develop that kind of skill. The the coach or coaches that would then argue not everything we do is always going to be about perception. Mm -hmm. There are times where I just want to be very technical. Mm-hmm. The players need to understand or learn biomechanically or from a motor perspective how to move, not why to move, not when to move, mm-hmm. just how to move. Mm-hmm. Where, where, where would you sit on that balance? Or is there a balance? Is there, like, is there a chicken, be, chicken before the egg, egg before the chicken scenario that we're talking about here? Yeah, that's a common, that's a common question that, you know, I comment, you know, what don't they need, usually people call it the fundamentals, right? Right. You need to learn how to stick handle before I can put you against other players or else you're not going to be able to manage, right? Um, Big idea, though, is that, you know, as much as possible, the how is determined by the what, right? The, you know, which way you go with the puck and how you need to move it is determined by what the environment is needed in the environment, what you perceive. And so you can't really separate those in the way people can. So I think as much as possible, we want to let it, the word we use is emerge, right? Um, If you can create good practice environments, the behaviors you wanted to put in from the start is, you know, will will come out. Um, That doesn't mean though, I think, you know, You can't, as a coach, say, you know, take a step back. You you see a kid playing a small-sided game or something with a bunch of players, and they're really struggling controlling the puck. Like, I I don't think that isolated 
kind of work focusing on you know controlling the puck i think you know i would that would fit well with the way i think but the what we what we don't tend to like is when you spend 45 minutes of an hour practice having kids by themselves handling a puck where they're not playing against any opponent it's just the proportion of time devoted to fundamentals is so large <laughs> it seems like yeah right yeah we we used to have this very predominant sort of theory in a lot of coach training in, in hockey that that whole part whole mm -hmm. approach where you know you start off with the whole and you 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 kind of deconstruct it or you break it down into its parts and then you put it all back together again is that what we're talking about when when we talk about creating environments that are that are going to allow our players to perceive to see things and respond to what goes on around them mm -hmm. is that really what we're talking about putting them in the hole um They're yeah a little bit you know the the whole part whole is kind of the old kind of way we, we've done it for long is sometimes we call it decom decomposition breaking the skill apart right so that's what stick handling around cones is you're, you're taking the the act of controlling the puck out of the game out of the uh, you know, having people trying to take it away. Um, so that's kind of part training, pulling it out, pulling, training just one part of it, right? Um, they're kind of, you know, so in an ecological approach, we try to like to move away from that as much as can and, and rather simplify. So take the whole, keep the skill whole, but make it easier somehow. So less players, different, more space, different, puck it's easier to control things like that sure. and, but still having kind of the full skill intact that's what we kind of try to aim for okay mm -hmm. when we had Stu and ed on mm -hmm. representative learning design mm -hmm. came up yeah keep you know keeping our environments representative mm -hmm. of the game and and it you know it, it was made clear by both Stu and ed that it didn't have to be exact it, it didn't have to look exactly like the game but it had to represent how important in this in this concept of perception action coupling is is representative learning design make or break like 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 is is can you get perception action coupling in your practices if they're not representative if you're not doing things that are representative um yeah i think so for me um perception action coupling is one of the kind of the criteria you need for representative design that's the way i would put it right so uh, for representative design we want our actions to be driven by the information that's going to be in the game other players you know pucks you know um, rather than some artificial flashing lights or something that's making you decide which way to move um, so to me, perception action coupling is, is one of the main components of representative design that you really want to look for, having the right information, having actions that are like the sport, you know, um, similar movement types of movements, dynamics. Yeah. So, yeah, I think they go together pretty, very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you just said something that was really interesting. You said we in our environments, we want our players actions to be driven by what goes on around them. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency sometimes in hockey and other sports, it's, it's not just hockey, I'm not picking on hockey here, but there's a tendency sometimes that as coaches, we will stand at a rink board and we will tell players mm -hmm. what we want them to do. Yeah. And then we say, go do it. How dangerous, I use the word dangerous, yeah. maybe, maybe in this extreme word, but how dangerous does that become as coaches when we are constantly supplying the solution? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it's going to, all of these methods, right, yeah, I always try to put it, it's going to help them. All of these methods, people learn, we learn almost no matter what we do, but we're, so we're kind of talking about more effective and um, the big kind of thing we would point to worry about is kind of how adaptable are they going to be? How creative are they going to be? Are they going to know, figure out what to do on their own when they get in a situation they haven't been in before? Well, it, it leads to very, we're a kind of fragile skill when you're always being told what to do. Yeah, so 
Um, I always, you know, I always like to say you want to give athletes problems to solve, not the solutions themselves, right? right. Let them figure it out. And and then also that it, it doesn't take into account very well individual differences, that the possibility that they might have a better way of doing the solution than you do, right? Because they're, they know their own for their own body, what works for them. Yeah. Right. It doesn't mean you can't guide them, and right? But as much as you, we try to move away from the kind of old telling, you know, do this um, kind of approach to coaching, yeah. Yeah, because th- this this came up when we had the episode with Ed, that whole theory of, you know, putting them in, putting them in a, a, a place where they can perceive, where they mm-hmm. can determine their own solutions. And then from that, we can then extract whether we have to isolate or get technical, Yeah, you know? Add more, yeah. I think so. I think letting them in those situations. Then, as a coach, yeah, if the what there's the solution they come up with, you know, is not going to be effective or potentially lead to injury, um, then yeah, that's where you can step in, add something else to the environment, um, add some instruction for sure. So now we're you know now now we're talking about constraints led approach. Like you were yeah. talking about, yeah. we've we've created an environment. It's not really kind of going where we want it to go. So we constrain it, we twist it, we tweak it. Mm-hmm. We don't really take out the perception, but it's going to guide them in a, a little bit of a different way. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Like on a so the idea is, can we? The way I always describe it, can we think of something to add to the practice environment that's going to kind of force the athlete to, to move differently and and in a kind of in a way we want, right? Um, so if they need to, we want them to bend down more. Hey, silly example, bend down more. We could say bend over, bend your knees, or we could just give them a shorter stick, right? And have them figure it out, that kind of thing. Right. Or, you know, focus at work on the stick handling, given the, you know, ball that bounces around more, uh, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Switching gears just a little bit, mm-hmm. kind of flowing out of this, but in both of your books and on several podcasts where you've you've been a guest and you've you've talked about these topics, the concept of action capacities mm-hmm. has come up. I'm going to op- just open with a real simple question for the coaches that are that are watching and listening. How do you define what an action capacity is? Okay. Yeah, this is a little tricky one. <laughs> So action capacity for me is like a physical or psychological ability. Um, so it's like speed, flexibility, strength that um, is kind of, it, it, it allows, gives you the, the way I like to say it is action capacities give you the potential to be more skillful, right? So being a faster skater, skating speed in hockey is like a capacity gives you that gives you the op- more opportunities to drive around defenders get through gaps right it gives you the more it's giving you more possible movement solutions right so uh, capacities are are you know cap- individual capabilities um, that the athlete brings to the table that we can we can develop usually uh, we usually we're doing those in a very isolated uh, uncoupled manner like we we train sp- strength in the weight room, lifting weights. It's not, you know, we don't do a reactive, read and react in the weight room, right? Right. So we're building capacities. So it's the individual kind of things that an athlete brings and a lot could allow them to be more skillful. Mm-hmm. So as coaches then, what is the impact? So again, going back to designing practices. Mm-hmm. What is the impact on me as a coach when I sit down to start planning the skills I want to develop in my players, the things I want them to learn? If I don't take into account their capacities, mm-hmm. where where can that go south? Like, what is the impact of? Like, yeah, where, I think like, yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah, if we do that, then uh, we're not, you know, the, the kind of the movement or technique you're trying to get them to do, they might not be able to, right? They don't have the capacity to actually achieve that. Um, 
that's kind of the biggest. You're not kind of taking into account their individual, what they bring to the table and what's going to work for them based on the capacities. Most coaches have a good sense of this already, right? They can tell by, you know, looking at a player. But, yeah, that's the general idea. Now, are these action capacities, when, when we look at a hockey player mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're trying to, you know, as a coach, we're trying to evaluate or assess the athlete so that we can kind of, or, or just in general, we're trying to determine what are the action capacities a hockey player needs? Mm -hmm. Speed, quickness, flexibility, strength, power. A lot of these things sound like biomechanical, motor related, like they sound very, um, you know, physical. And, and you mentioned there's also some psychological things, your emotional yeah. strength and your, mm -hmm. your, 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 we'll call it your brain power. Yeah. Is that all they are? The, the, can action capacities come outside of that category? Or are um, we typically always talking about things that, you know, I, I train in the gym. I train away from the ice to get them better so yeah. that they can come into the practice rink with me. Yeah. So um, I generally like to try to keep them there because the problem I think happens a lot is people treat skills like their action capacities. Like stick handling is not an action capacity. It's a skill, right? It has a pur It's a purposeful goal-driven movement where you're picking up information. There's lots of possible ways to do it. How, you know, your action capacities, your speed, your balance come into that. But so I think it, we have to be careful. Like we, one of the things we love to do in sports is treat agility like it's an action capacity, right? Um, we're going to have you run around, you know, we're going to train and run in these tires and ropes and whatever. And then you'll be able to pull that out and put it in the game. Um, whereas the, that's a real, those are real skills. I like to think of them as better. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, Rob, is as a coach, there's always a potential that I could be placing my athletes in a learning scenario or a learning environment where I am asking things of them that physically, from an action capacity perspective, they are not able to do. Yeah, I think so. I think there's... Um, or, or, yeah, giving them, trying to get them to move in certain ways or use certain movement patterns that they may not be able to achieve. Or, and the other one that I've seen before, it's kind of, they might actually not see the opportunity that you want them to see, right? Why didn't you drive through that gap, right? If they don't have the capacity, the speed to do it, they don't even really see it as an opportunity. So, yeah, that definitely can happen. So that brings me now that last comment you made about you know why didn't you drive through that gap mm -hmm. well i didn't even see it yeah and now what we're talking about is you know we, we've kicked around sort of perception and action coupling mm -hmm. what i see what i read can drive how i act how i act can then change what i see or how i perceive things yeah now what you're suggesting to all the coaches is if a player is not skillful, they might not perceive things that we see. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, so going kind of in the ecological approach is this idea of what we call embodied perception, right? So we don't see the world in terms of that thing's five meters away, that's a meter tall. We perceive the world in terms of our ability to act on it. So there's research showing that, for example, if you ask people to judge the slope of a hill, they say it's higher when they when you make them wear a heavy backpack full of books, right? Because they have less capacity to climb it, they perceive it as steeper, right? So if I do not, the idea, if I don't have the same speed and ability to accelerate, a gap's going to look smaller to me than someone that you know, because it's not going to look like you can get through there. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. It's called sometimes called embodied perception. Yeah, Embodied perception. Yeah. So we, we perceive the world in terms of what our body uh, allows us to do with it. Mm -hmm. So a player, a player that may not be the greatest skater on your team will potentially perceive things they see around them. Mm -hmm. 
much differently than your greatest skater on the team. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, going to see less oppor opportunities from the environment, kind of. Um, yeah, and we've seen this. We see that we've done done some research with how big batters perceive the baseball to be, and it depends on their skill and, and various other factors, how big it looks. So that kind of weird, uh, you know, the the net looked as big as a you know a, a ocean. Kind of weird comments athlete makes sometimes have some truth to them. Yeah. So I've I've heard you tell our coaches the capacities that an athlete possess will greatly dictate what they can achieve from a skill acquisition or how they can become skillful at a point in time. Mm -hmm. So if I don't possess the capacities, I will be limited in things I will be able to do. Mm -hmm. I've heard you also say, if I am limited in the things I can do, I will actually see fewer solutions to problems in my environment. Mm -hmm. Does this all connect to the concept or the dangers we get into when we try to coach or teach to what you referred to as the one ideal solution? I think so. I think that's, you know, we, you know, and that doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean that they can't be successful, right? They just might have to do it a different way. Right? Sure. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, especially with younger kids that, you know, we, they, they find out they can't do that, you know, and they get discouraged and, you know, don't want to come back to practice the next time. Yeah. You know? So how many, how, and this is a bit of a baited question. You, <laughs> you probably look at me, you'll probably look at us and go, I can't answer that. Mm. But what I'm hearing then is, if I'm coaching or working with a team of, of hockey players and I have 15 of them, I have to be prepared to accept 15 different solutions to things. Um, yeah, I think you have Potentially. to yeah, allow no. for variability and you know different ways people are going to respond. Um, yeah, in, it is. That's a very challenging thing, obviously, right? Being a group of different skill levels and trying to coach to it instead. Of, but you know, as much as we can, we do want to kind of individualize and let people. That sometimes the term we use, self-organize. People let your your kind of own body find it what works for it. Yeah. Okay. So. This is we have, or I should say, they. I'm no longer a school teacher, but in, in the education system, we have what we call or what are referred to as IEPs, individual educational plans. Mm -hmm. But in the sport world, we kind of tend to take an entire group of players on a team and clump them under one solution umbrella. Yeah. There's one way to skate. There is one way to shoot. There is, there is the right way and all the other ways. Mm -hmm. Everything we've just discussed and what you've shared with us about action capacities, so... I'm going to call them the physical or motor traits of the athlete mm -hmm. and what they possess or do not possess. That impacts how skillful they become. And then how skillful they are impacts solutions they perceive in the environment. I now as a coach have to be really, really careful about adopting this notion of all 15 of my players should be able to do everything the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have to think more in terms of, you know, what – what is it? What is it that's in common between the good skaters? Like the principles, right? Um, the uh, the expression we I use, Randy Sullivan and I use in our baseball book is think conditions, not positions, right? So there's conditions to being a good skater: balance, you know, all the you know that those don't have to be achieved by the same body position exactly by everybody. You know, this knee bent in this way, uh, you know. That's kind of the way we like to think. So it doesn't mean you can do just anything. Like there's certain things that have to be there to be a good skater, for example. But but there's lots of different ways to achieve the same, that same thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, you mentioned, you, you just very quickly mentioned the concept of self-organization. Mm -hmm. um, just for our coaches, before we dig into some questions around self-organizing, mm -hmm. just for our coaches, like what is a simple definition of 
players self-organizing. When a, when, a, when a hockey player in practice is self-organizing, what does that look like? What are, what are they doing? So the basic idea is instead, so their body is kind of um, reacting to the environment to kind of find something that works, right? So um, if my if I want to stay balanced and I go a little too hard, far on bend my knee, left knee a little bit too much, my body will automatically tight, tight, tense, put tension in my ankle or something. They'll work together. So your body's kind of working together to keep balance rather than your brain saying, Okay, bend the ankle now, stretch your leg, right? So your body's just kind of making these adjustments and um, sometimes you call them synergies, but different parts of the body working together to, to achieve your goal. Yeah. So the, the analogy, the example I always give for self-organization is a flock of birds, right? So a flock of birds move, each bird kind of moves together without anyone telling them all what to do. But they kind of self-organize themselves. So... Is it an individual concept or can it apply also to like a, a group? Like can yeah. you have five or six players self-organizing together? It can, um, yeah. So it can apply individually, your body, the different parts of your body are thought to self-organize, but also at the team level. Yeah, the different player parts of the play, you know, working together, right? So player, you know, on, on like on um, like a good team, on defense, right, as one player goes to the shoot, shooter, to, to the puck carrier, you want another player to change there where they are and move to fill the gap, right, without having to tell everyone exactly, you know, a set of rules of how to move. Yeah, so it, it applies to both for sure. Okay. Yeah, so team coordination. So it applies to team coordination and individual coordination of your body. So... Is just trying to just trying to think of the analogy that might exist in the typical sort of hockey coaching jargon. Is is self organizing just another way of saying I'm allowing the players to find their own solution? I, I'm I'm giving them I'm giving them a space to learn within. I might be constraining that space. Maybe it's rules or numbers of players or size of space, but I'm, I might be doing something to manipulate the environment. And then I just let them learn. I let them find their way, or as you put it, I let them self-organize. Yeah. Is that, is that, am, am I yeah, right here? Yeah, yeah. I'm letting them, I'm, I'm kind of guiding them. Like that's a, the essential of the constraint side approach. I'm adding something to practice that kind of takes away what they're doing now and encourages them to do something different. But they're gonna, what they do different, I'm going to let them self-organize. I'm going to let them figure what it, that is on their own. Yeah. Now, I, I kind of want to pull some of the stuff from Stu and Ed forward because, you know, we've we've kind of, we've we've come through a, a, into our third episode now where we're. What we're talking about is this whole ecological dynamics, constraint-led approach, nonlinear learning or nonlinear pedagogy, as, as the research calls it. Mm -hmm. How am like can can I can I achieve the things that you talk a lot about in your book? Perception and action coupling, that read and react quality of the the, the practice environment. Can I get self-organization? Can, can all of that exist if as a coach, I either do not understand or more importantly, I am not really working inside of an ecological approach or I don't practice design nonlinear uh, formatting and I, I'm not using constraints-led approach. Like if, if those things aren't there, Mm -hmm. Do I lose all of that other stuff or can it still exist? Um, I think it's very hard. Like I think like, um, like for example, if you are telling the traditional, you know, telling the player the solution, like you're talking about their body a lot. And I still see this. This is a really hard thing to move away from in, in sports. That's the way we all learn. That's the way we want it. If you do that, right, what you're essentially doing, you're not allowing the body to self-organize. You're trying to tell it what to do. 
um, which inherently leads players to try to do that, right? So players start getting, in, in the research we call it an internal focus of attention. So really thinking about what your body is doing. Um, what, where, what's, how much is my knee bent? Where's my elbow, you know? Which that not that has shown to hinder self-organization. So, um, so I think it, it's hard. It would be very hard, I think, to use a lot of the kind of things we traditional kind of coaching methods and promote self-organization. There's a lot of different ways you can promote than just constraints. Um, there's some other things you can do, but I think it would be hard. Um, you, you definitely need kind of coaching methods that are commensurate with it. Right. Now, we're, you know, we're, this series, this five-part series is, is kind of, it's, it's certainly centered around a different way of looking at skill acquisition, you know, mm -hmm. kind of breaking away from the traditional, moving more coaches, more towards an ecological mindset. Mm -hmm. Things are nonlinear. Uh, and, and how to, how to go about designing practice and, 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 and promoting that within the learning environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Is is this is this all or nothing for you? Like I've asked all of our guests this so far. Like, are we talking about? You, oh, I've either got to be all ecological, or I have to be all you know all nonlinear or all linear. Can balances occur here? Um, I you know I have a kind of strong opinion. I I tend to think it's hard to do both ways. Uh, I think you really need to commit to it. Um, um, for example, like a lot of things I see, like in, in in hockey and soccer, a coach will set up a small side of the game to kind of let athletes figure it out, and so, and then they'll they'll start it, and then ten second, fifteen seconds later, they'll jump in and start telling players where they should be and what they should be doing. Right. So, it's to me, it's you know, I certainly meet a lot of coaches that kind of want to kind of stick with so I, I you know I try to meet coaches halfway all the time so okay so you want to keep doing that okay how can we make it more variable more representative and try it but I think in the end if you have kind of a consistent one approach I think it would be better um, I know not everybody agrees with that though I think um, but I think a lot of them seem to be counter to fighting each other um, the different things yeah okay I I, I asked that question because there was a really interesting comment I, I can't remember i believe i stole it off another podcast that you, that you spoke on mm -hmm. and and the the comment was if if you're using if you feel you're using a constraints led approach so if if as a coach you feel like you are in that cla approach mm -hmm. model ecologically mm -hmm. non-linear driven and, and you're doing your best and you're trying it but if the result of that doesn't have your players self-organizing, then you're really not in a constraints-led approach. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's at the practical level, it's hard to decipher. And I guess, you know, I say you have to do kind of one or the other, but to me, there's nothing wrong with an ecological approach with if something's not organizing the way you want it. Right. Trying to guide people like... Um, like I'll I'll set up a constraint drill and a hit it batting practice and then the batters you know kind of struggling with it I'll I'll say why don't you try bending your knees more, right? So it seems like the but it's just meant to to get them to try that. It's not meant to you have to do that. So it depends on how you do it and how you use it. I think. Um, but yeah, I think you know if you are if you are adding a constraint to to force them to move in some exact way that you want, then it's probably not really the constraints that approach in the first place. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah, so I think, you know, I think how, committing to the idea of self-organization and, and, and representative design and kind of pushes you <laughs> kind of in a certain direction for sure, yeah. where everything kind of flows together. Mm -hmm. One one of the real one of the real trends certainly I, again I keep referencing the your books that you've you've written and that I've read and and and, and following you as a, a learning resource, but one of the real trends that I hear and I see is and and this is this is my 
phrasing here. It's not, it's not anything I'm quoting from what you wrote or said, but it's the sense that I get that as coaches, we need to try to find ways where we don't start with isolation, linear, giving them the solution for the sake of getting them to a game or representative environment, mm -hmm. but rather start with that representative environment and then pull out into that isolated format when we really, when we feel like, okay, now I need to, but then yeah. get back into that representative environment sooner than later. Yeah. Or I, even more idea than pulling out, like, can I add some other kind of constraint or change the environment to kind right. of help this person? Yeah. yeah like I, I, I coach tennis every once in a while. And, you know, I, instead of having a kid stand in a line and here's how you do a forehand, you put your one foot back, you put the one in front, you know, I'd much rather like, just play rally the ball over the net and see what happens. <laughs> and usually nine times out of 10, they'll adopt that position anyway. Um, but then you, you could come across a kid that has no eye-hand coordination at all and right, can't hit the ball at all. So that is just keep putting them into that rallies is not going to be productive. We have to kind of pull it back and work on some more fundamental things, you know, maybe a uh, bigger ball, you know, not lower net, you know, different kind of things. Yeah. 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 Fabulous. Um, Rob, before we sign out here, uh, how can coaches connect with you, follow you, hear you speak more often? Yeah. So the easiest way to, is uh, perceptionaction.com is my kind of main website where I have the, my podcast and my books and, and um, uh, I do some YouTube videos every once in a while. Um, but yeah, that's the main place. Yeah. Right. But yeah, and, I'm, and you can, there's a place to contact me there if you have any kind of specific questions. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Fabulous. And, and for all the coaches watching, you will, will clearly see on the bookshelf behind Rob, <laughs> both of his books and, and the one in the green cover with the large word move. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, cannot, I, I cannot off. stress enough. It, yeah. it, it, is a real, it is a real game changer. Uh, when you read that. The second one, probably fair to say, Rob, that your second one gets a little bit more scientific. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, kind of but The, the yeah. first one I thought was absolutely fabulous. It, it stays relatively simple. It's easy to understand. Thank you. Very applicable to the hockey world. Um, so, yeah, coaches, it's uh, definitely, uh, if, you're, if you're in the local Amazon online bookstore <laughs> someday. It's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a shameless plug for Rob Gray. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, uh, thank you so much on thank behalf you. of myself uh, and Hockey Eastern Ontario and all of our coaches. Thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is a busy schedule. Um, and we will, uh, we will certainly get this published online and, and let our coaches start listening and hearing and Hopefully it'll drive their journeys like it, this stuff has with me over the last six to seven years um, and start getting them. We, we said in the early episode when we started this, the goal is to start providing opportunities for coaches to think about mm -hmm. a different way. Mm -hmm. And, it, it, you know, if we, can, if we can get coaches moving a little bit more away from that old traditional linear isolation solution-driven type of coaching and start dipping their foot in the shallow end, maybe a slow start, but to start dipping their foot into the pool of, of this information and, and these methodologies, um, it'll be a sort of a, I think it'll be a, a real gain for mm -hmm. all coaches who, who give it a whirl and, and try it. I know in my coaching, especially my skills work that I've done, I've, I've adopted more of this over the last few years. Um, and it's certainly a much more fun way to coach. Yes. Sure. I enjoy it much more, yeah. and I think my athletes enjoy it much more as well. So, yeah. cool. so well, again, Rob Gray, thank you very pleasure. much for your time. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you for having me on. Thank you.